Hello, and um, welcome to this uh, Google Hangout. I am Sebastian Turbo, and I'm the curator and director of content at the World Innovation Summit for Education, an initiative of Qatar Foundation. I have the honor today of facilitating this Hangout co-hosted by Ashoka and Lego Foundation, and the lead up to the 2015 Ideas Conference, which will be held in Denmark in April. Last year, the two organizations co-organized the Reimagine Learning Challenge. The objective, the challenge was to identify pioneering and innovative projects demonstrating the power of learning through play. And this is what we'll be discussing today in this Hangout with four of these pioneers and a 45-minute conversation focusing on formal versus informal learning. By the way, don't hesitate to share your questions to our guests through Twitter using the hashtag play to learn that's hashtag play, do as in the number two, and then learn. And I'll be taking your questions and giving them to, to the panel. Now let me quickly introduce our four guests today. We have uh, Jan van Miepen from Ludink. Jan and his team at Ludink have designed a quest-based game featuring a time-traveling professor. I'm looking forward to knowing more. We have Grant from CodeSpark. You are the co-founder of a pick-up-and-play game that teaches children as young as five of programming principles and computer science concepts. We have Naveen from Tackle. Tackle creates playful spaces in Indian slums where young volunteers lead their peers through a curriculum in theater, music, dance, storytelling, reading, and the arts. And finally, we have Brendan from Insti Institute of Play. The Institute is a program where students don't just listen and take notes, but where they are dropped into a complex, inquiry-based problem state where learning is practically irresistible. Uh, Jan, I'll start with you, and actually this is a question I'll be asking to all four of you. To all four of you. Could you tell us what, what problem, what, what challenge you identified, and why you think informal play-based learning is a solution, and hence the rationale behind your project? Please, Jan. Well, I think one of the, the more general problems that we're faced with in education today is that uh, many people take a student as a sort of vessel that um, has to hold knowledge that is being poured into them. And they're then expected to retort that knowledge at, um, at the drop of a hat or whenever it's needed. Um, the, the trouble, though, is that a lot of the, the things that we uh, learn in this setting are later on not really um, that relevant. And um, I think, and this is, this is something that I learned uh, recently. I, I read uh, um, um, an OEDC report, which said that actually learning takes place all the time. And, um, the most relevant skills uh, that we learn, we learn in um, more informal settings, simply because um, those things tend to be the ones that are most relevant to the problems that we're confronted with. And um, so I think that um, you know, learning that takes place in everyday situations and learning that takes place when we're engaged in play, it's actually a learning that is um, oftentimes more relevant to the problems that we face than the, the, the things that we learn in more uh, sort of formal settings. And so, uh, Jan, in, in, in your case, can you tell us a bit more about your project uh, and how you think it's, 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 uh, it's a way to address uh, learning issues? Yes, well, the project is called Professor S, and Professor S is uh, the story of a time-traveling professor who has uh, invented uh, a time machine and uh, but during the first time jump something goes terribly wrong um, and he gets stuck in the past and the students uh, basically uh, get delivered a, a little version of the time machine into the classroom which they can communicate with him and um, so there, there is a, a dialogue that ensues out of um, the, the problems that Professor S encounters, but he's always in trouble. And he's constantly asking the students um, 
to help him, um, you know, with his time machine, or he's confronted with uh, some serious problem in the past, like, for example, uh, he needs to, need to find out more about uh, uh, dinosaurs that are plaguing him, or he needs to find out an expire. And so he's often confronted with very real and very concrete uh, problems that we need children's help with. And because uh, the problems that he encounters are framed in a real context, the, the kids can more easily relate to, um, to his needs. And, and, and therefore, the, the things that they learn are not really uh, things they learn because it happens to in, in, the, in the textbook, but they're things that have a, a real and, and concrete relation to something that's happening in their world. And, and, and that's why I think it's, A, they're more motivated to help them because they see an immediate need, there's a person that needs their help, and B, they're more um, easily able to retain what they've learned because they remember the context in which they've learned it, and it's, it's, it's a story that they can relate to. Okay, so thank you, Jan. Uh, I think we'll come back to some of the concepts you just developed, like like motivation, retaining, and relevancy. Uh, let me turn to you, Grant. Um, can you tell us a bit more about about CodeSpark? And I think you have a specific focus on well, it's, it's on science, but with a specific focus on girls, I think, and people from low-income backgrounds, right? Well, we're certainly, yeah, we're trying to massively increase uh, the number of kids that get exposed to computer science, and the gaps are in low-income students and, and with girls, right? So we're not exclusionary in any way. We're, we're inclusive, so um, the product is for boys as well. Um, but we lean toward girls, I would say. So, like, the game that we've developed, just one small note on how we do that, uh, the very first character you see is a girl, right? And um, so let me talk a little bit about the game. So the way that I came to, f you know, found this company and um, start start Code Spark and build our game, The Foods, was I was doing research um, on teaching computer science to older kids and realized that we really hadn't changed how computer science was taught for 30 or 40 years. It was still a lot of like move the robot uh, games and um, we didn't really have an ABCs of computer science if you will. Um, which struck me as odd because it's you know digital literacy is certainly one of the keys to success in an increasingly digital world, right? So um, you know our theory was we needed to start with kids as young as possible so that we could both let them build knowledge in a subject that's pretty difficult um, at a reasonable pace just like we do with reading or math um, and then so that we could also build confidence um, the way we've typically taught computer science is we can we throw it at uh, gifted students you know when they're teenagers and uh, they either stick to it or they bounce off and it's um, it's unfortunate because we don't we don't share it with everyone. And now that's that's rapidly changing just in the last two years. But it's a very recent movement to try and teach younger kids. Um, so th you know this game that we built uh, has no words in it, so that a kid in China can play like a kid in Italy can play like a kid in Ghana. Um, and uh, it's pick up and play because one of the biggest problems with teaching computer science to more kids is that there's not very many qualified teachers. And if we wait for teacher capacity to be built, you know, it'll be a decade before we make a real dent in this problem. So uh, while adults can absolutely add value to our game and teachers can use it in their classroom, um, you know, a kid can play it anywhere and be fine. And then the other part of our mission in terms of trying to reach as many kids as possible is that we're multi-platform. So we've developed uh, in a technology called Unity that allows us to publish to Android and iOS and the web, Kindle Fire, kind of almost anything you can name, so we can reach kids in as many ways as possible. Um, and you know the biggest gap in teaching computer science was with this younger age group and the reason we picked a playful approach is because we just think it's you know the way 
you teach kids under 10 in particular, but really all people, is you have to hold their attention, right? <laughs> and you, you don't get the right to teach anything um, unless the student is self-motivated to pay attention and, and take the next step, whatever the next step is. And so, uh, you know, we felt that a game was the right way to draw kids in and, and make them feel powerful quickly. Uh, traditionally with computer science, you had to do a lot of work to make something very small happen when you were learning. Um, and so we've kind of turned that on its head. Now with a little bit of effort, you can make something very big happen, and then slowly but surely, we open up um, the process more and more so that kids understand the details. Um, but we want them to feel powerful right away. Okay, thank you, Grant. Um, sure. Both your, your, your project and, and the answer project are uh, technology-based. Uh, let me now turn to Naveen uh, from Tackle. In, in your case, Naveen, uh, it's still informal, it's still play-based, but it's, it's, uh, it's not a digital project. Can you tell us a bit more about, about Tackle? Yeah. Firstly, in the context in which we work, I want to endorse what Jan said and uh, a lot of philosophy uh, based on which we work is very similar to what he said. The context that we work is, um, uh, you know, in the slums and low-income areas of Bangalore and rural India. Uh, so one of the problems that we face is one, uh, we came across a lot of children hating schools, uh, running away from schools, a large number of dropouts, uh, and also very low comprehension of school subjects. Uh, so that was a, one one of the problems. Second was we we saw that fear governed most of their learning lives. Uh, there was fear of punishments, fear of failing in exams, uh, fear of subjects. Uh, for example, uh, English as a foreign language, uh, you know, uh, created a, a nightmare for a lot of students that we uh, dealt with. Um, then. Uh, we also came across a lot of insecure primary relationships, especially due to stressors of life and poverty. Uh, uh, children abused in one way or the other, alcoholic fathers or overworked mothers, unsafe neighborhoods. Uh, so in, in all this, learning academic subjects or learning was the last thing, uh, learning from school was the last thing on the child's mind. Uh, so this is the context in which our work uh, started. Uh, so our project uh, deals with equipping the youth around the community to work with children by creating safe spaces for play. Uh, so uh, and we try and use play because we believe that's the natural language of learning for children. Uh, and in fact when we started off we started with academic learning and trying to make learning fun through games and uh, uh, you know, creating games for that or trying to use what existed in the market. But uh, we found that the kids coming back more and more to us to say, uh, you know, can we can we do art, can we do uh, music, can we do dance. So, um, so we heeded that line of thinking. Uh, and so now we see, so what we typically do is we look at youth, we see what they are skilled in, whether it's in dance, whether it's in art, craft, uh, theater and then we train them to work with the kids on that and in the process they build <coughs> sorry they build relationship with the kids and <coughs> sorry once that is done learning happens naturally uh, whatever form of learning it is and so basically what we do is create that safe space for play uh, for children Okay, thank you, Naveen. Uh, I'm I'm curious. We can see all these boxes with toys behind you. Is that part of your, of your of your approach of your program? Uh, well, our project room looks very similar to this because a lot of people donate their uh, toys and uh, stuff which children can use for play. Mm -hmm. uh, so so it is quite similar. But this is my home, and uh, we are homeschooling our kids, so it's their stuff. And I'm using their space <laughs> to have this chat. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, and finally, Brendan from uh, Institute of Play. Uh, Brendan, same question to you. Why, why the Institute of Play? 
and what approach are you taking into in in, ter in terms of uh, informal learning and, and play based learning? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I guess the the major problem that Institute of Play kind of was founded around, uh, and and this is sort of mentioned already, is this sort of engagement um, problem, especially as kids get into the uh, kind of middle school ages. Uh, you know, research shows that there's just a major drop off in engagement in, in their schooling um, around that time, and one of our theories is that because of is that the um, the design of the curriculum it changes. You know, when when you go into middle school, it becomes a lot more uh, this sort of like the, the kid is a vessel that the teacher must pour knowledge into, and and it kind of departs from the way elementary school uh, has has traditionally been taught with like more play and games and kind of a nurturing approach. Middle school seemed to be this like drop off point, and and we see when we lose kids, you know, that's really where it starts. And then once it starts, it becomes a feedback loop in which it's very hard to come back from. Once you've lost your engagement and you start losing um, your progress and your learning, you know, especially in subjects like math, as soon as you lose some foundational properties, uh, it's really hard to, to to keep up. So Institute of Play was founded around this whole idea that uh, games. Games and play, uh, you know, have these really natural, magical qualities that that allow learning to be a much more, you know, engaging and holistic kind of process. And what we we try to do is basically identify the things that make games and play so engaging, and apply them to uh, a more formal learning environment, like the classroom. Um, so we we have what we call the, the principles of game like learning, and um, you know, out of out of some of them, we one of them is learning happens by doing, and and so. That is, it's a general concept that you know, in, in games, uh, clearly you are you are doing what you're learning about in a game. You know, you're, you're jumping and running and solving problems. So if you take that idea and apply that to the classroom, you know, as, as opposed to uh, looking at a lecture or a book about about a subject, if you're engaging with that subject in some way by doing it, uh, you're gonna you're gonna get much more uh, engagement and uh, deeper learning out of that. Um, I noticed. Uh, uh, we were talking a little bit about uh, fear-driven education. This is this is another one we have a, a principle around. Um, rather than being afraid of failure, why not reframe failure as uh, an, a point of iteration? So one of one of our, our learning principles is failure is reframed as iteration, and that's the whole idea that um, you can try something and if it doesn't work out, rather than being afraid of a negative consequence, you should be able to assess what went wrong and use that as a learning point and to try again. And to uh, try to make improvements each time you go. So with an iterative process, uh, you know, just like a designer might do, uh, testing out their assumptions and making prototypes and iterating and play testing some more, uh, kids can really engage with what they're learning, and also produce creative projects that are related to what they're learning, rather than say answering questions on a test or um, or just you know re re repeating facts back to the teacher. Um, we have we have a bunch of these learning principles. Hopefully, a few of them will come up more uh, organically as we go. But that's okay. the whole idea, right? Taking the taking the principles that underlie games and, and play and applying them to learning. Okay, thank you, Brandon. Um, we have a question coming in for for Naveen, but I guess it's it's a question I would have for 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 all four of you. Is is about is about the ecosystem uh, and mostly parents. And someone is curious, Naveen, to know how how you've managed or not to change the the mindset of parents in India towards uh, learning through play. Um, I think that's um, that's one of the most uh, pertinent things that we deal with in our day to day work, which is that um, you know learning is seen as very different from fun, but most of our programs happen to be fun. So they see, uh, I mean, so people find it very difficult to look at the learning uh, in it. Uh, you know, so even today's uh, discussion on formal and informal learning, and I think it's it's better if we frame it as natural and unnatural learning, because play is, is a natural uh, learning method. Um, now, uh, it, it takes a lot of work to convince people uh, and it initially starts off with children who have uh, what is defined in mainstream as problem uh, kids. You know, so 
parents of such children come to us and see uh, say that they see a lot of change in their children they are able to sit in class schools uh, where these children go to they come and tell us that uh, uh, you know children uh, are able to you know their relationships have improved because of which they are able to adapt in the classroom environment because of which their academic uh, performance is increased so it starts off with such kids uh, but slowly uh, you know since we have consistently been working in the same communities now more and more parents come and they wait they plan their programs around us so there's a great deal of change and like i said uh, our context is a low income context i see a greater resistance among uh, among the more well off folks who refuse to see uh, you know the learning uh, and the fun and learning being related uh, in fact, I've had parents, uh, you know, who are quite liberal in their thoughts on education say, uh, I want to change my children's school because all they seem to be having is fun there. So that is a mindset which is quite difficult to change. But we have seen change and uh, I, I'd be interested, interested to know what the others experience. Okay, thank you, Naveen. Uh, great, uh, great story here. Uh, Brendan, you're, you're working directly at schools, right? So you as well... Uh, come head to head with the administration, with parents. How has the, the, the reaction been on, on, on your side? Uh, I mean, on our side, um, I guess I guess in terms of the entire ecosystem of education, the, the most problematic is actually like very high up in the system, right? So parents, at least in my experience, and maybe that's because the work we do is a bit, you know, parents and families uh, kind of self-select into, uh, you know, the kind of curriculum that we, we create. Um, Similarly, the teachers and the administration do as well. So, it's it's where it's the situation in which that entire th th those people are situated, uh, you know, into sort of the greater political landscape of education is really where we start to run into problems. You know, um, especially when as the kids get older and uh, over reliance on uh, standardized testing to assess both the kids and the teachers suddenly becomes a huge stopping point when um, a teacher feels like they have to cover uh, you know dozens and dozens of different things for a specific test that's coming up at the end of the year that a lot, that gives them a lot less affordance to um, experiment and try kind of more playful solutions in the classroom um, and that affects the kids and the parents only to the point where they start to become concerned about say getting into college or even getting into uh, their, their preferred high schools you know in the New York City system um, the high school selection process is is almost as intense as selecting a college, and so uh, parents will become very concerned if those test scores start to impact their students, their children's abilities to get into the schools they want to. Um, so that that's really where I would kind of say is the major stopping point, and um, and and kind of source of a lot of problems. Uh, parents parents would love their kids to to really get those deep learning concepts through inquiry based learning. Uh, up until the point where if it if it hurts their their ability to get into the school. Okay, uh, interesting point. And there's the behind that uh, indeed there's a question of of measuring learning outcomes to play in informal learning. But I'll I'll come back to that uh, a bit later on. Uh, Jan uh, Grant, do you do you want to 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 react on this question of the the reaction of the wider ecosystem and maybe some some resistance to yeah. uh, based learning. I'll jump in just quickly. I'm sure Jan has something to say too as he works with a lot of schools, but um, it's interesting. There's definitely people who have played games in their life and see the value and people who haven't, and I find that the people who haven't naturally played games as part of their own childhood tend to have more resistance. Um, we get a little bit of a pass because we're dealing with a subject that almost everybody is scared of, which is computer science, and so the idea of taking all the sharp edges off that is appealing to teachers, parents, and kids, and they kind of get why this thing that's seen as a little bit scary could be um, introduced more easily in a playful environment. Um, but even so, uh, even when we're compared to some of the competition out there that's more structured and much less fun, um, you know, people tend to point to things like, well, they have a a, a more clear feedback system, you know, and then our argument is yes, but your kid doesn't want to actually do that particular game, so you know you've already lost the war. Um, so we have a lot of conversations like that, but I think there is a general um, 
beginning of understanding, at least here in the U.S., in among parents that um, we need to change the way we think about learning in general and that learning is starting to be less and less about just gaining knowledge and it's much more about problem solving and where to find knowledge and then what to do with that knowledge when you find it. And these require different skills and the parents don't totally know where those skills are going to come from but if you can explain to them that a game teaches a lot of the things that a child needs to know, persistence and creativity and so forth, then uh, you do start to connect with them. Okay, thank you Grant. Uh, Jan, uh, what about you? Yeah, <clears throat> well actually We've presented uh, the, the project recently at a, a large uh, trade show here in Germany. And um, the response, for, both from teachers and parents, has actually been overwhelmingly good. And it's, it's shown us that there's a real a demand and a real need for um, play-based uh, solutions, um, such, such as we were uh, creating, you know, that there's... Um, um, that people want uh, to use these applications uh, in schools and also at home. And um, the, Naveen really made an interesting uh, point uh, earlier that I wanted to uh, pick up on because he said that um, often kids that um, appear to have learning difficulties at school uh, perform particularly well on the play -based, um, in a play-based environment. And we've made exactly that uh, experience as well with uh, Professor S, that kids who are normally um, sitting quietly at the back of the classroom, um, not really wanting to engage with other children or participate in, 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 the, in the lessons, that uh, when they start communicating directly with uh, Professor S, because we use a lot of... Um, um, you know, a video presentation techniques. So the kids sit in front of the computer, much like I, I'm doing now. I'm standing in front of a camera and I'm talking to the camera, presenting ideas to the camera. And that's what we ask the kids to do as well, except they present it to Professor S. So they're talking to a person who is um, um, perceived to be their equal because he's asking them for help, right? So he, he's already they're in a situation where, well, if he's asking for help, he must... Uh, take me seriously, you know, and those kids, particularly those kids with learning difficulties, then really come out of their shells and 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 and, and manage to um, surprise their teachers with uh, feats that they never thought they were capable of. Yeah, and that's something that that has really impressed me, um, and and uh, something that we've seen um, again and again in schools, um, and um, you know, because. Grant and I have been talking about the possibility of integrating um, the CodeSpark application in the Professor S platform. We took it to the to this trade fair as well and presented it, and 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 it got uh, got an overwhelmingly uh, great response. You know, people are actually interested also in um, you know um, computer science based applications because computer science, media literacy. You know, anything that has to do with new media, new technology is really something that where teaching skills are lacking and people want to use innovative applications. They want to use uh, things that, 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 uh, that teach these things because you know, um, where else um, are they going to get them? Okay. Thank, thank you, Jan. Um, I'd like now to, to move more into... The kind of the, the the concrete details of your of your methods and your approach, uh, um, but since time is already running short, let's play a game together. Let's say I'm a I'm a teacher, um, and I come to all four of you, and I ask you for what's the one thing, the one little takeaway you could give me, the one little tip on play-based learning that, that you would recommend that I try to to implement or try to put in place with my with my let's say 80 year old students here in Paris. And maybe starting with uh, with you, Brendan. I mean, I would say the the one thing that I would tell a teacher in that situation is mm -hmm. to not consider it like vastly different from their normal practice. Just try to take their normal practice and to change just just change one little thing about it to try and make it a little more playful and just see how it goes and just and try try and push your comfort zone, but don't you don't have to jump off into the deep end and suddenly be this crazy you know game like. Uh, 
teacher that does, you know, like there are people out there that do amazing things, and you don't have to like emulate them if you don't feel comfortable doing that just yet. So just start small, take little steps. Okay, so start small, take little steps. Uh, Naveen, do you want to? So what, what what would you tell me? I'm a I'm a teacher from France. I'm visiting you in India. What would be the, the one takeaway I could uh, I could take with me back to Paris? I think um, you know the recent news article from Finland uh, saying that they're doing away. I mean, there's an option to do away with academic subjects, and uh, you know, give children the time and space to explore things at their own uh, pace. Uh, I think that is, for me, being uh, I think the greatest message in play that I've seen in recent times. So, uh, give the space. And don't structure life so much with subjects, academic subjects, with um, uh, different kinds of activity. Even play itself is structured so much with rule-based games. So leave it open. Uh, give children the space to explore. OK, thank you, Naveen. Uh, and, learning follow and learning follows. OK, so thank you, Naveen. Uh, Grant, what about you? Um, so I love what's been said, and I would build on, on that, start small, um, that rules uh, remind people that play has rules, which I think people tend to forget, right? Just like society, where we're operating under a series of rules. And then the thing I would add to what's been said is um, do a small experiment with putting the learners in charge, right? Figuring out a way to get the students involved and, and a little more responsible for their own learning. I think that's a really important part of play, actually. When you watch kids play on their own, right, kids uh, automatically will switch between who's the leader and who's making the rules and what those rules are. And so if you give your learners a chance to do that, they just get more engaged and um, are more invested in the process, I think. OK, thank you, Grant. Uh, yeah? Well, I don't know. I think I would uh, I would ask uh, I would tell that person uh, that um, they should allow children to tell stories about what they what they learn and what they most enjoy about learning. Um, because um, when you tell stories, you tend to to frame what you've learned into context that you can you can understand, you can grasp, and uh, when someone is able to tell a story about something that they've learned, it shows that they've really understood it. OK. Uh, very nice image here, here Jan. Um, OK. Next question to, to all four of you is, is informal and play-based learning suitable for, for everyone? Or are there some students, some learners, for which maybe play-based or informal learning is not the, the, the best adapted uh, method? Anyone want to? Want to, want to comment on this? I, I have a quick comment. Uh, I'll jump in. And I think the question's a little bit backwards in my mind. Um, and it, it's the idea that one way of learning fits all kids uh, just doesn't jive, right? I think we all learn in multiple ways. And certainly some people you know, are more structured than others. I think play is an important part of learning for all people, is what I would say. But many people will need to learn in several other ways in addition to play. That would be my quick reaction. OK, anyone else? Uh, yeah, I guess I could also I say that question also has this assumption that play-based learning is uh, one thing and not a category of many, many different things. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure there are subsets of play-based learning that certain kids might not respond to as well as others. But then there's others that they would. You know, it's, it's a huge category with almost infinite and probably tons of undiscovered possibilities. OK. Let me kind of tweak the question now. Uh, now that we've got two reactions. I guess it's a question of, do you see a future uh, where informal learning has replaced more formal learning? Uh, is it about replacing schools, or is it about bringing more informal learning into the school uh, institution? Uh, I would say I would probably say it's more the latter. I would definitely see um, more formal uh, environments taking on the elements of informal learning um, to further their goals. You know, it's something that we've done in our work already and it's seeing success in. So I can only imagine 
that, that success would continue with the loud. Okay. Uh, Jan, Brad, Naveen, you want to? Yeah. For, 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 for example, you, 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 Naveen, apparently your, uh, your, your programs happen on school grounds, but after official kind of school hours. You yeah. see a future where your programs are actually part of the, the curriculum. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, just also build, building on what Brendan said, uh, I think uh, play-based learning is more an approach than a method. Uh, so uh, in that way, the whole the formal learning system, which I earlier called as an unnatural learning uh, environment, uh, this may not fit in as a method there. Uh, so I would see there's a need for a o uh, whole o overhaul of the system where this approach where learning happens naturally is recognized and given its due place. Uh, we, you know, we see um, three-year-olds, four-year-olds pick up the latest Android uh, system, figure out its uh, the way it works, uh, and you know, uh, while we have uh, people failing in computer science and not able to do the basics of mathematics, children figuring out games in different languages which they haven't even heard of. Uh, so I, I believe there's a need for this approach and. I think if if play goes into a school as a method, uh, it would again lose its relevance because uh, it would be just another way of sugarcoating what somebody else wants uh, children to learn. Yeah, thank you, Nadine. Uh, Grant, Jan, do you want to uh, want to react? Well, I I can. Speaking just for myself, you know, I, I was uh, spectacularly bad uh, in school and uh, I failed at many things, uh, succeeded at some, but the things that I succeeded in the most are the things that really interested me and the things that I really enjoyed for one reason or another. And that often had to do with, um, you know, engaging with uh, something in, in actually in a, in a playful way because when you enjoy something it means that, um, that you, you're happy to, to try things, try different approaches and see, uh, see what works for you and, and, and what doesn't work and experiment, you know, figure things out for yourself and I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that, that's a skill that's more and more in demand. It's certainly a skill that, that, that I look for when, when I, when I um, uh, when I look to hire people, you know, and um, bec because you know more and more people need to uh, work um, independently of you know having a set of instructions, and they need to um, they need to be creative problem solvers. They need to be able to figure things out for them for themselves, you know, and that's and and that's that's what's required. And I think teachers recognize that. I mean, they are, after all, they 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 see that every day in their in their classrooms. They see, you know, how 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 kids engage with uh, subjects that they really enjoy, and and how they shut down when they don't enjoy something. You know, so um, I, I think it's uh, inevitable that um, that playful learning is 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 going to be used more and more. Okay, um, I see that time is is starting to run out. Um, so I'll get to my last main question, uh, which will be the tough question, which is the, the classical question of should we, can we, and how are you measuring uh, learning outcomes through through play? Uh, maybe starting with, with you, Grant. Yeah, so I, I believe that we should and that we can, um, and that actually games are well suited to do that, um, but I believe we need to reconsider what a successful outcome is. Um, we've gotten really uh, bogged down, I think in particular in developed countries, but probably all around the world, with uh, standardized testing. You know, certainly here in the United States, that's what is driving many things. And so, but within a game, you know, we can track how often a concept is used and whether there seems to be mastery of that concept or not, and whether that concept uh, is reapplied in several different circumstances. And then outside of the game, we can test whether they carry the knowledge with them to a different environment, right? And so I do believe we should 
and and can measure that. Um, but we just have to be more creative in what we measure and what we think about it. Okay. Well, Grant, uh, you were you were, you were saying earlier that uh, your, your your game, since there's no writing, it can be played uh, in China and Italy. Uh, mm -hmm. If if I'm an Italian teacher or parent, um, and I and, and I ask you that question, you know, you, you yourself are American, you don't necessarily know my culture, you don't know the curriculum in my in my country. How can you help me understand that? I can that you can still help me measure the learning my my kid is 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 getting through through your game. Yeah, I think you know localization is more challenging in in uh, depending on the subject. But um, the good thing about computer science is that the core uh, ideas that drive it are somewhat universal. You know, the names of the concepts are different, and and we'll be you know doing uh, localizing that with voiceover eventually, but. Um, I think that we can show that logical problem solving and algorithmic thinking and uh, understanding um, sequencing, that these are all things that are fairly universal and that we can both track the child's progress in terms of using those concepts by how far they make it in the game and, and how creative they get in the free play areas um, and we can, we can show that that knowledge is useful. Okay, thanks. Uh, Did it your question? Well, yeah, sort of. But I mean, <laughs> I'm you know, I'm just here to, to uh, I, I won't comment on it, and I'll turn to to Brendan. Uh, I think through Intuitive Play, you have a pretty uh, developed uh, measurement system. Am I am I wrong? Um, not you're not you're not wrong, but I don't know if um if it's if it's done in the way that you're picturing it. Um, no, 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 sorry. <laughs> but please, please tell us. Yeah, so, I mean, data is a thing that we, uh, you know, everyone's grappling with in terms of measuring, like, student outcomes and, and, and analyzing kind of how everything, uh, it, how successful our methods are. Um, what I usually detect in, like, that kind of question is, you know, how, how are they, uh, do, you know, how is it making them perform on standardized tests or, or how are they able to, say, you know, answer this question properly? Our, our approach is a lot more on... Um, assessing kids based on what they create. Um, most of the time, if we're putting them in one of these sort of complex problem spaces, the outcome is not, um, you know, a quiz or a test. The outcome is a product. And uh, measuring that product is how we, how we see if they know what, what we want them to know. So are they demonstrating the knowledge uh, and, and applying it in this, in this context to solve a problem? Um, so it's, it's interesting because a lot of people kind of desire this really simplified number of what the kids know, but how do you quantify uh, something that, you know, we're, we're sitting here and acknowledging that uh, what the kids need to know is in, in, in this complex, you know, world that, that, that have skills that you can't necessarily measure with a number, like collaboration, communication, and all these other things, and so why would you want the assessment to be reductionist when we are acknowledging that the, uh, the actual knowledge itself is not a simple measurable quantity like that. So um, the I think that the solution then is to, you know, you have to use a human to measure a human and not like a machine. You know, so that's why you look at product and, and put the trust on the teacher and the educator to be able to measure that based on what products the students are creating. Yes, uh, I think was it, is it Paul Tuff or Tony Wagner who t takes the example of how um, uh, the example of music, you know, uh, a cello professor will not actually try to grade his students. It's more a, a peer-based uh, assessment of the of the learning outcomes. Um, Jan Grant, Naveen, do you want to? Well, uh, Grant, we've heard you. Uh, Jan, Naveen, do you want to to comment on this Sorry. question of assessment? Yeah, one yeah. super quick comment. Even though I I know I commented already, but I just think what Brandon said was super important. And with computer science, for example, you know the reason computer science is important is because you can use it to problem solve and to create interesting things. Right, and so that's again the, the the desired outcome is to show that ability to use it in context and and figure things out. Right, that's the win. So anyway, I'll I'll step up. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, our assessment is uh, we can call it twofold. If you can even call it an assessment, uh, mm -hmm. one is to see this whole aversion towards learning in our context because of the method, because of the environment. 
to see how that can be reduced to a level where you're open to learning. So that is one. And the second is your readiness to learn, because what what is given right now is a certain way to learn, which uh, you know many of the kids, most of the kids, don't even relate to it. Uh, the kids that we work with, they don't relate to, they don't understand, they don't care for it, uh, and they may never learn it because they've developed that aversion to it. So one is this bringing back that whole self-confidence and self-esteem to say that you know you you you, st you can still learn your learning every day. And second is you know uh, uh, what do you say endorsing or uh, uh, there are different methods of learning. Grant had. Uh, mentioned earlier that children have different learning styles and all of those are important so you know endorsing that and uh, uh, encouraging them for what that is so our assessments are towards that and how do we do it it's 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 only through stories it's through what they share with us uh, you know a new thing that they learned a new thing which they want to learn uh, but it's not put into a standardized test and I don't see how we can do that. But learning outcomes, I think, like this, uh, are, are not recognized in the mainstream. Uh, fundamentally, because it challenges the mainstream, uh, the way the mainstream uh, education is run. OK, thank you, Nadine, on that. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a whole other debate on you know, how the mainstream could or could not integrate these, these, these assessment methods. Um, Jan, do you, have a, do you have a comment on this question of, uh, of measuring or assessing? Yeah, well, we don't really have any measurements in place uh, at the moment. And, mm -hmm. and part, part, part of the reason uh, why this is so is because uh, it, it, would, it would completely um, um, break break our frame of, uh, of, of of what what's possible for us to develop, and and that's because you know the the skills that we uh, teach in the game are actually fairly uh, hard to to measure as well. You know, we, we're teaching things like um, media literacy and and competency in in terms of you know communication skills and being able to. Um, get an idea across concisely in a little uh, video presentation you know and uh, and so it's um, it's 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 pretty hard uh, for us uh, to measure the uh, learning outcomes other than you know in in teacher satisfaction you know like feedback that we get from the teachers and how they feel that the learning outcomes have have improved as a result of playing the game having said that uh, we do have a, a partnership with a, a university um, who is uh, going to send their students on a mission uh, during the, the coming school year to to uh, to find a quantitative impact measure. But quite how they uh, attempt to do that, I'm I'm not entirely sure at the moment. Okay, uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, time is is running out. Uh, before before I conclude, do any of you want want to 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 share um, a last uh, last comment um, to our to our to our listeners, our viewers, actually? Okay. Uh, well then, on, on this note, I'd like to, to thank all four of you and to all of those listening. I think we had a really interesting conversation with lots lots of little stories and the kind of concepts to, to, to continue the conversation on. We talked about motivation, we talked about dropping out, we talked about safe spaces for learning, failure as iteration, play as a natural language of learning, uh, changing the mindset of parents, starting small, finding the space and pace, putting the learner in charge, uh, and telling stories about what you learn. I think these are all very interesting takeaways. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the conversation with us as much as I did. I'd like to thank you all, Brendan, Grant, Jan, and Nadine, for your, for your time. Thank you, uh, Ashoka and Nigo, for, for hosting this conversation. And uh, I hope to see you again uh, soon and to further the conversation. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.